on uh, to the virtual platform. So if you'll be patient with us, um, the colleagues in the trade room. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. I hope I'm audible. Good morning to everybody in the council chamber and good morning to our colleagues on the virtual platform. Uh, welcome to the Garden Root Skills Maker Forum, which is a forum that happens once a quarter where we get around the table or in the room and even in the virtual room. Uh, between uh, business, uh, public sector departments, our CETAs, our municipalities in this particular district, to specifically look at what are some of the opportunities 
economic development plans that we want to implement, but also more importantly, the skills development plans. Uh, my name is Anika Jacobs. I am the provincial manager for the local government CETA. Um, and I'll be I almost said your host for today, but I will be chairing the session today. Um, as we know, in the local government sector, we just came out of the local government elections. And as councils in this districts are still being constituted, we are waiting for the garden route um, uh, council to also be uh, constituted, I think it's later this month. Um, and then there will be a chairperson um, elected for the training committee, which will then assume this position. But for now, I'm holding the seat warm, whoever might be taking the seat. I think we all received, and before we start, can we maybe just have a minute of silence um, for um, silent meditation, if you will allow me. Thank you, everybody. Um, as part of the invitation you received, you also received um, the agenda for this engagement. Um, and I will quickly just go through that, um, just to inform you that we are recording this proceedings. Um, we will be addressed today. Our keynote uh, speaker will be my boss, uh, my chief, and I will do a formal introduction of him later. Um, and it's the CEO of the LGCTA. Um, we will then take a short uh, break and it will be followed by a conversation between some of my two of my favorite humans in this district as well, which is Dr. Flores Prinsloo, who is the coordinator for the Garden Root Skills Maker and the primary STF at the um, Garden Root uh, Municipality or District Municipality, Mr. Reggie Salmons. It will be followed by a brief update from myself on the what is happening in terms of the CETAs and what commitments has been made by CETAs um, in this district. Um, and then lastly, we will be having a presentation to look at what is the one plan or the district development plan, or as we coin it in the Western Cape, the joint district and metro approach implementation plan for the garden route. And that presentation will be done by Melanie Wilson and Paul Hoffman from the Department of Planning and Economic Development on behalf of Mr. Um, Lusanda Menze. So that basically, ladies and gentlemen, is our program for today. We will uh, request all speakers to please um, stick to your allocated time and so that we can finish on time at least by 11.30, um, quarter to 12, as indicated on the agenda. So just before I do the brief introduction of my CEO, I think one of the important things, and I maybe just want to do a reflection on the difference between silos and synergy. And I'm going to read the definition of silos mean, because generally when we work in organizations or structures or in the districts, we tend to be turfy and we tend to work in silos. So, the, so silos is referred to as a mindset present when certain individuals or departments or sectors do not wish to share information with others in the same organization. So I'm asking all of us to reflect so that you can find yourself in any of these definitions. But then we want us to move towards synergy. And the definition of synergy is, means to combine or work together in order to be more effective and to, and to achieve organizational strategic goals or in, in the case of the district, to achieve district goals. So the, the skills maker is one of those vehicles or forums where we want to find synergy. And that is where we all come from our different structures. We all come from our different organizations, but we want to, when we sit under this particular umbrella, we want to find a way to work together. The LGCTA wants to work with its partners, its stakeholders, our municipalities, local and district, but it also wants to work with the TV college in this particular district. We want to bring business closer to the table and each of us need to craft out what it is that we're bringing to the table and how we will be working together to ensure that we, um, we achieve the economic development required in the district. So that is just my reflections for this morning. And as we move along, I will now take the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker um, for today, um, which is Mr. Inneling um, Muleti. He is the chief, um, the chief operating officer or executive officer, my apologies, for the local government CETA. Mr. Inneling have, or Mr. Muleti have 
15 plus years experience in the skills development arena. He has previously worked at the um, EW CETA as the chief operating officer. He also worked in the education space for the ET, uh, ETDP CETA. So he's got a wealth of experience in skills development. He joined the organization in the beginning of this year. So he's not new anymore. He's been with us for 11 months. Um, so he found his seat, he knows exactly what to do and how he's going to steer the LG CETA um, um, forward. He's got a master's degree from the University of the Northwest in human resource management. And so he's well averse in terms of um, human capital development, skills development and all of those areas. It is my greatest pleasure today to share the platform with my CEO, and he has been given a brief around the district development model as per, um, as per indicated on the agenda, which is looking at the implications for the garden root stakeholders on the support from the local government CETA aligned to the integration with the district development model. I hand over to you, sir. Can my class let me know when I must just move the slides. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Person, for a very colorful uh, introduction. Um, thank you very much to the committee for inviting me to study in route uh, district municipality. And uh, thank you very much to everyone in the chambers and those who have uh, joined us virtually. We do not take these invitations lightly. Yes, it is a very beautiful sight of the country, but uh, we, as LGC, needs a needs to understand the mandate that we have as a CETA and this very same existence of why CETAs were formed late 1999, beginning of 2000. When CETAs were formed, they were meant to transform the economic development of the country when CETAs established, they were meant to improve the business opportunities of the marginalized groups in our various communities. When CETAs were established, they were meant to give the dignity of the workers who could not have formal education yet having the experience of how a municipality needs to be run. When CITAS were formed, they were meant to improve the employability of people who do not have skills, expertise and knowledge for them to compete economic opportunities in their local economies. When CITAS were formed, they were meant to make sure that they share the grants accordingly to stakeholders that they serve. Hence, when you see CITAS and their existence, the Port of CITAS composes of community-based organizations, of business, of uh, labor, and any other structures that are necessary to stimulate and galvanize our local economic development. Coming here and agreeing to this invitation, because sometimes when we sit in our air-conditioned offices, we tend to forget the basic foundation of why CITAS are existing. And it's very difficult for us to leave our conditioned offices to come and see the decisions that we make on behalf of our ports and seeking justice and clarion to say, 
is this what we need in the sector for us to be still existing and going back to those five, six uh, very foundations of the cities. And a lot of times in our bureaucratic world that we operate under, we tend to forget that as and when we talk AGSA, as and when we talk budget reviews, as and when we talk annual performance plans, as and when we talk strategic plans, as and when we talk our sector skills plan, we have foundations that we have to look at. And those foundations that I've highlighted, we always have to reflect to say that, am I still doing this? I have three kids and uh, my daughter is turning 14 in, um, in January. And you may ask yourself, why is he telling us about his private life? When I got uh, the, the position of the CEO of Chief Operating Officer in Energy and Water City, I asked a very simple question. What do you tell your friends what your father does? And then she was about eight or nine years. And she answered me very simply, say that I tell my friends, but my father is in the business of skilling and developing people. And that's a very, very, you know, simple definition of what we do. Let's put aside bombastic weights. Let's put aside decorated weights. Let's put aside our emotions. Let's put aside our big egos. And let's put aside the, uh, the perks that comes with the positions and the responsibilities that at the end of the day, when I knock off each and every day, do I reflect and say, I have transformed the local government sector. Enough about the sermon. I am invited here today to talk about the implications for cutting root stakeholders on the support from the LGSTA aligned to the integration with district development model. That is the presentation. Osanika will tell you, uh, I'm not a fan of presentation because they limit you and they box you because something is prepared and you must talk to it. And unfortunately, that's why probably um, Osanika in my CV, I must put that I'm a PhD dropout and I'm very proud twice because I... Uh, as and when you have to be structured, you know, you do proposals and say, okay, back forth, back forth. Yeah, I tend to get bored and focus on something that needs immediate attention. And I, I, I don't know. I've promised my father before he died that I will have a PhD, but uh, I'm not sure because the world today needs agile leaders. The world today needs, needs disruptive leaders. The world today needs people who will think on the ground and on their feet. And sometimes having to spend 18 months just dealing with one aspect of the challenges that we have in our communities, the challenges that we have in our sector. I am not sure if I'm, I'm cut up to still allow myself to be subjected to those high ethos. And maybe I will wait for an honorary in my 60s that uh, that I will get, but I do encourage people because now when you talk, you have to be uh, politically correct because you're in the chambers. I don't want to be quoted tomorrow to be saying that I'm not for people getting PhDs. We do fund PhDs uh, and post the uh, doctoral uh, studies. The overview of my presentation or the presentation, which I will not uh, because it's shared, you can always go through it and check, but I'm going to try boot from uh, our annual general meeting or my median annual general meeting that we had yesterday, that I try to, to expand to the issues that are fresh coming from the mandate that we received yesterday or from our stakeholders. And, um, and then uh, Please forgive me where in I, 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 I do not go through each and every slide. You can do that. I'm assuming that people who are here can read and write. 
own time and student and so forth. But I'm going to try to hammer on the issues that I feel would be of benefit because when you call a CEO, you want to be saying, hey, yeah, no, at least I've learned something. So I don't want to bring things that are already sitting in our planning documents. I don't want to bring things that you already have pre, you know, privy to because I'm aware that this forum is one of the most run forums um, uh, in LGC. Uh, I mean, the invitations uh, come from very high ranking officials from the minister, ministry, shareholder ministry, uh, and also our ministry in terms of culture. And there's also business, there's also labor. So you might have, the, I don't want to come here and talk things that you already know and say, why did we give him an hour? Uh, and what did we learn? And, and, and so forth. So this is the overview of the, of the presentation. And I will try to be structured and to make sure that at least I do service to this. The, the, the first question is district development and what? What is district development? And why do we talk district um, development model? Yes, we know that the DDM was launched, I think September 2019 by the president of this country. And I know that in Western Cape, we you refer to joint district metro approach. Uh, the DDM uh, is a strategic integrated framework that facilitates intergovernmental relations to enable the three spheres of government, national, provincial, and local to function in unison and to promote uh, uh, synergy, cooperation, coordination, collaboration, and integration of service delivery areas. Now, the chairperson, when she started, she, she defined what silo means and she defined what synergy means. And I, um, I think it is a reality today in South Africa that we live in that we do not find each other starting with sitters. And um, the reality is that in LGC, we've got 374 million each and every year to transform the local government sector. And we know that the 374 million is not sufficient for us to transform the local government sector. And how do you make sure that with that 374 million, you are able to bring other revenue streams to make sure that you you make impact out there. The only way that you're going to do that is through synergy. And the question would be, when, uh, since you came here because you are here for 11 months, what have you done as LGC? Um, in my first port on the 23rd of March, I took a document called Partnership Development Model. In that Partnership de Development Model, we are saying that for LGC to be able to be taken seriously in the local government sector, we need to identify who are our partners. And in that document, we have identified critical partners. And we start with CITAS. You look at to the 21 CITAS, we've got five, we've got six CITAS who we have identified as strategic partners. The first CITA. Um, not because the chairperson is here, a services CITA. Because of its own definition, when you look at uh, standard industrial classification code. The second CITA is energy and water CITA, not because I used to serve as an CEO there. The third CITA is chemical uh, uh, CITA. The fourth CITA is construction CITA. The fifth CITA is uh, MER CITA. And why that? 70% of what is in our standard industrial classification code is the same. You talk energy, you talk water, you talk infrastructure development, you talk project management, you talk road infrastructure, you talk environmental issues, you talk um, uh, water issues, and it's eco system. Therefore, you can't run away. We need each other to collaborate. We need each other to cooperate. We need each other to coordinate. We need each other to integrate, to make a difference out there. Therefore, I can tell you today that 
I've got MOUs with all of those CETAs, including the insurance CETA. So what we did, we said, let's have a partnership model. And then after that partnership, we identified a strategic uh, partners. And we said, we can't go out before we deal with the CETAs that we can collaborate on. And then secondly, we said, who are the other government partners? We identified Department of Treasury because when you look at our strategic documents, our first strategic plan is around a good uh, management and, 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 and leadership. The second strategic pillar is good financial prudence. Therefore, excuse me, you can't do that in isolation with the, 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 the people who are responsible for the fiscals. Of, 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 of the country. Therefore, the second, um, 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 the first was, was, was the Department of Treasury. Then the second one, we said that it's going to be the Department of Cooperative Governance, traditional affairs. And why that? One, we are in the cooperative governance. We are responsible for municipalities and we know who is the shareholder in terms of um, municipalities, it is, it is corporate, cooperative governance. Yes, now through the pandemic, we now start to see the value of the disaster, the management of the disaster management of this country because which needs to be updated by the way. And whose responsibility is that? Question mark. Thirdly, we, okay, let me just expand also the traditional component. When you look at our planning, LGC the planning documents, on top of the five strategic areas, we do have, sorry, we do have the, the, the eight board focus area. Because remember the board reports to the minister on what is it that you've done as a board. So we've identified eight areas and one of them is traditional leadership. Because we can't run away from transforming local government and not dealing with the, the traditional leadership. Understanding what is traditional leadership? Because when I got there, I looked at the commitment schedule, I saw projects and my question was, what is our, what is our approach to traditional leadership? Do we take the developmental approach to say that, do we look at the traditional leader who is sitting on the throne? Do we look at the Royal Council that appoints the traditional leader. Do we look at the tribal authority that looks at the governance of the tribal affairs? What is it that you want to address? What is happening in KZN? Because it is happening in the monarchy. It's something that happens each and every day. It's just that it happens on a lower scale. The chief dies today, tomorrow. Now, five, five people emerges. The uncles wants to be chiefs. The sons and daughters of the, of the traditional leaders are now suddenly not the kids of the, of the traditional leader who dies. Now there's issues of protocols now. Who is supposed to ascend the throne? And as and when this, uh, these things are playing, in the gallery, who is suffering? This is the communities. You can imagine uh, who is responsible for Ingonyama Trust now. With the passing, what other developmental opportunities are we missing by not having a chairperson of the Ingonyama Trust by virtue because the king of the Zulu nation by virtue of his ascension becomes the, the, the chairperson of the Ingonyama Trust. How many community development initiatives are being missed by not addressing the issue of ascension of the, chief, of, of the king? Now, I'm just making one example uh, that affects the development of many subjects that these people. So how do we address that at the context of local government? And what we are doing, <clears throat> As LGC done now is to make sure that we have a clear strategy on how do we address. Are we addressing 
when we address traditional leadership, are we addressing only the people, who, the, the person who sits, or do we also address the kids of that person so that tomorrow they must not fight? I'll tell you a secret. I come from a royal family. I'm a prince. But our father took a developmental approach. There's a CA, there's a lawyer, there's an advocate, there's a teacher, and there's me who doesn't have a portfolio. Finish with no portfolio. Because his approach was that let me develop my kids so that tomorrow they are not going to fight. In fact, they will support uh, uh, the lawyer who is now the chief. The, so when you, when you sustain this, we, you, you need to have a strategy in place to say, how do you want that? Because indigenously, we can't abort our history. Uh, you know, we know what is happening with, in, in Western Cape. And I don't want to bring the issues that are happening at Union buildings. When are we going to address that? Because it's part of our history. And for us to move forward, we need to know and be able to know who are we. So that is the second part of uh, the, the, the second um, uh, player that is Cocta. The third player, it's any other government department. I know that public works is big because they are responsible for the accommodation of all government departments. And for me, in my previous life, I used to use them, particularly when it comes to intense work integrated learning, because a lot of times our focus is on service providers, which is only 30%, by the way, of most of our programs. But we forget the 70%. How do we resource, how do we transform workplaces to become an active places of learning? I think my role in these five years is to make sure that we transform workplaces into the actual panaceas of learning through proper mentorships, through proper partnerships with our international players to know that actually, if you want to produce an engineer, you know that by sitting in this municipality, you can be able to get people who can be afforded an opportunity to, to, be, to be developed. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time and, and, and I'm trying just to narrow the discussion of our approach to partnerships. And then we look at the private sector because the business is here, I need to be also pro-business. I have approached, for instance, invest, uh, banking in South Africa. Many municipalities are using our banking for, 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 uh, for, for, for purposes of daily transactions. What is the role of banking in ensuring that they assist us with the service delivery issues that are faced by the municipalities? I've challenged them. Investec has come to the party and they've said that, look, it's a start, but we are willing to partner with you and make sure that in all our banks, we will make sure that we, we give you, you train uh, uh, plumbers, you train electricians. Why? We are sitting in an air-conditioned uh, boardroom now. We are sitting in a boardroom that has got lights. We are sitting in a boardroom that has got technology for, for, for sound. Who do you need? You need electricians to maintain this technology. Plumbing. There's a pollution facilities here. There's water here. And it is very critical that as and when in any municipality or in any, in, in any invest tech branch that these facilities for purposes of maintenance, then you need artisans. It's a small project, but they, 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 they are saying when these young people are done, we are going to put them in our contractor development program. They can set up cooperatives, they can set up uh, SMMEs, and that is hard skills development. It's all about. We are no longer interested in that of 13,000 learners. Where are they? Where are they now? How are they participating in the current economy, formally or informally? So as LG CETA, we are saying we cannot do this on our own because of limited resources. You can imagine, um, you know, I drove from Nysna this morning, very nice road. Go to my province in the Northwest of Perth. 
and look at the roads. And the question is, how do we assist provincial governments and national governments in maintenance of the roads? We've got the road construction qualification. We've got a lot of loitering young people. Why not putting them in the program? Why not partnering with the Department of Transport for them to buy machinery to close potholes, do road markings? In that, you are contributing because now the trucks will not be avoiding your routes. They'll be using those routes. They are pouring diesel and petrol. They are buying slab chips and, and fish there. They are buying airtime. They are reviving the local economy. They are buying Sowetian citizen, play their pick six and whatever. They can sleep. From a tourism point of view, they can sleep in that particular town. Because of one thing, there's no potholes. Now, we need to have what we call intended actions and not just find the economy moving because we don't know. We need to be intentional of anything and everything that we do. I made an example. I, uh, I was doing a keynote for, for young people uh, because I'm still young at heart. Because sometimes people say, a young CEO, I don't say I'm not young. I don't, I'm not going to say, no, no, I'm, I'm young. I'm not young. But I know that we are young at heart. The issue of closing of the alcohol. I do drink, but occasionally. But I just want to show you the effects of closing liquor. Firstly, you, you, there's people, the security, who guards the premises. SAB. Secondly, there's people whose sole job is to go and clean at SAB. Thirdly, there's people whose work is just to pour water in the boilers. There's people who, there's boiler makers. There's people whose work is to make sure that they move, uh, uh, you know, whatever ingredients that are needed to produce a beer or a wine or whatever. That's their work. There's people who, whose work is after, is, is just to cook. There's people from there, and sorry for loose weights because I'm not a, a, an expert in that, but I'm just trying to show you the value chain. And from there, there's people who, you know, package. There's people who distribute, there's drivers. And from drivers, there's people who sold there. Now you get to the Shedi, or you get to your macros or your tops or whatever. So you 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 have you have more than 20, 25 occupations that gets affected because you are closing um, alcohol industry. And I'm not saying it's, it's right or wrong. You know, I believe in science. So far, recently this week, there was a study that says there's no relationship or correlation between closing of uh, alcohol and, 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 um, and numbers going uh, soaring up. There's no relationship, but again, it's, a con it's continuous study. So I'm just making these examples of the decisions that we make and how it affects the local um, uh, jobs and the local economies, because if you don't earn, then you are not going to participate. You can buy bread, you can buy milk, you can buy petrol, you can even buy candles, you can buy electricity that we generate as a municipality, you know. So, okay, I have 10 minutes. I told you, uh, 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 I don't like this presentation, but I, I want to focus on 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 some of these critical um, issues. So, we the role of LG CETA in the context of DDM, from a science perspective, is to is to is to firstly identify what are your your economic drivers in the in the district. One, I can tell you, I've seen agriculture. Two, I can tell you that I've seen tourism. Three, I'm aware that petrol is here, so you talk petroleum. 
four, or you can say energy. Five, there's, there's ocean economy, because with ocean economy, there's, the, 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 there's multiple facets. You can talk gas. With ocean economy, you can talk uh, supply chain, because you move commodities uh, using water. You know, there's, you can still uh, generate uh, hydro uh, uh, electricity or hydro technology through the the the, the seas, and and what is the role of LGC in there? The role of LGC one is to make sure that you have one plan. Local municipalities come together and not compete and say, look, for this financial year we are going to need to, 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 to identify what KPIs are we going to look at and how are we going to address them. I've, I've, I've highlighted four areas. Now, how do we get to this? Through bursaries, through artisan development, through work integrated learning, through uh, career guidance. I've said to my colleagues internally, we've developed what we call a bursary strategy. I said, we, the, 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 there is a relationship untested. The problem statement is that there's a relationship between municipalities that are doing bad with metric results and, and the service delivery, untested, who's good. Why am I saying that? Um, most service delivery issues are coming, uh, is water, it's electricity, it's roads. Now, how do you deliver this when you don't have the skills in the municipality? Where do you get the skills from? You think that if as a municipality, you develop your own engineers from townships, from informal settlements, and you give them bursaries, and you give them workplace training, are they going to, are they, are they going to live? This beautiful area? I doubt not. Do you think if you develop your own scientist or uh, environmental technologist or engineers and, and accountants that they will leave or they will steal from, the, from where you know that this boy was attended this school, was raised here, you know their mother, their uncles and whatever, do you think that they will, they, they will steal the resources? No. So it's high time that we need to change the, the mind shift of municipalities. How do we retain and start to plan for what? We are here. That's the role of LG CETA in the context of supporting municipalities. But most importantly, we can't just be training young people, colleagues, and we do not find exit opportunities for them in the municipality. As and when you do contractor development, how do you make it fashionable that 10% or 20% uh, needs to be subcontracted to the, to the lo local? I know you're, uh, uh, DTI is doing that, I'm not sure about municipalities. How do we bring and revive our local economies to make sure that um, we, you know, we support the people that we train. I was making an example earlier with the MM when I was introduced to say, you've got a qualification called uh, domestic appliances in LGC. You go to a, to, to a township, four bedroom house, you go to a suburb, three story, and a uh, I hope I'm saying it right, Mkuku. You are going to find a TV, you are going to find a micro, you are going to find a kettle, you are going to find an iron. Where do we repair that? In town. And when you go to town, what do you do? You eat there, you, 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 buy, you buy things for convenience, whereas you could have done this in your own area of um, uh, where you stay. So for me, the, the approach that we need to use is to make sure that internally you look and say, what are the opportunities that are here? And how do we harness them in terms of the skills development? And how do we fund? And how do we partner? I said to the MM, I come from a small city, big in scope, which is energy and water. I used to be in the country only for four weeks. 
for the past five years before I came here. Went out to go. I know all the donors in the world. Go and ask for money in partnering. I've done that already with, with the Swiss for finance. You might be getting uh, extra funding for finance, for counselors and um, uh, internships for young people on accounting, SCM, so that we comply and, and, and ascribe to good governance and food security. Can't run away from food security because as a municipality, you need to create sufficient. We have to have what we call uh, food banks and make it fashionable and make farming fashionable to young people in pursuit of um, food security. Waste, nobody own, owns waste. I developed two qualifications that are said energy and water of uh, waste packers and uh, e-waste. Who, who controls waste? There's a lot of money there. We know how do we use waste? How do we separate waste? How do we regularize waste and make it? Because there's a lot of money there. For purposes of taxes, how do we start SMMEs in understanding of um, uh, waste water? Desalination. We, we, we say day zero in Western Cape, but we've got we've got uh, uh, C. How do we bring those skills into the municipality of desalination? You go to Westin Hotel in Cape Town. They've got their own desalination plan. Now, how do we partner with business to make sure we don't have to do it in a bigger scale and get skills? We do exchange programs with international partners and and, and, and take young people from here. Uh, teach them desalination. There's underground water. It, it can't be right that in South Africa, after 27 years, we still rely on dams to, to give us water. And round water, the oldest um, uh, technology that they use, that they still mix chemicals for us to have good, clean drinking water. When there's so many technologies out there, it's, 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 it's really upsetting. And really, uh, we need to work together, collaborate, Synergize and not compete, but but complement um, uh, uh, each other. And some of the immediate pressures that are sitting here, they, we don't need to, to limit them to 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 that we don't have money. I mean, the issue of potholes. Let's see how we we we, we partner. I mean, the issue of of primary health care. I look at our stand. Uh, we've got a qualification in drone engineering and technology. How do you help the elders so that they don't have to be living in their houses and we drop their med medicines there? And in that, you are avoiding unnecessary traffic and emissions. You know, one good deed, you end, it, it's got split seven, eight uh, focus areas that are impactful and so forth. So I, I, moving forward, for me, one is that let's take our job seriously. Two, let's collaborate. Three, let's change our mind shift. Four, let's use our skills development um, forums. Can we have forums and just talk WSP, WSP? Yesterday I was asked a question in the AGM. What is the quality of the WSPs that you are receiving? Remember WSP are primary source data that we use for our SSP. Now imagine if we don't have if you have a skewed research report, then it means you're going to have a spent money where it's not needed. And then, and then there's not going to be impact. So we we want that kind of partnerships and colleagues, I hope, have done save justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, CEO, um, for your input and to share and articulate the position of the Alpha Theta and also in terms of some of our strategy. I just want to reassure um, our colleagues that all the presentations will be shared by the Secretariat of this forum um, so that you'll be able to obviously go through those and engage with the partners that you, that you need. Um, in terms of our agenda, we have a short interlude, we have a short break of 15 minutes. It is now just on 10 to... So maybe we should allow the last uh, 10 minutes before we break for tea. Just an indication if there is any questions for um, our keynote speaker, Mr. Indalik Moletti.
anything on the virtual. Let's first check if there's anything in the chamber. Any colleagues that want to ask a question, you are noted after Prince Lou. Any other hands? Is there any questions on the virtual platform, uh, Reggie? Yes, um, Anika, there's a hand from Mr. Andre uh, Komutu. So let us go with the colleague on the virtual platform first. Uh, Mr. Komutu, please, you have the floor and will be followed by Dr. Prince. Hello. Uh, audible, sir, please proceed. Um, at this stage, I don't have any questions. Oh, okay, so you just wanted to say good morning to all of us. Good morning to you, too, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, sorry, sorry, uh, Anika, there's just one and also uh, was, um, one Stephanie from the Water Academy. Okay, but let's proceed with Flores and then we'll uh, give Lynn an opportunity. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. And uh, thanks very much, Mr. Maletti, for that uh, very insightful conversation. I think it was really, it was really a nice just listening to what you're uh, talking about and so on. I, I thank you for the slides as well. The, the slides have a lot of technical input and I think we'll use them beyond the session definitely. But just listening to you, I think, was very, very useful. I am really particularly interested in what you mentioned around traditional leadership. It's not something that has yet um, come up in the skills maker discussions. But uh, I know that in our area, traditional leadership is, is quite a, a very uh, significant uh, and has a lot of impact in, in our area amongst the communities, you know. So I'd be really interested to know um, what is this project around traditional leadership that the LGC is, is thinking of doing? Maybe a little bit more detail in that, because it's something I think that we may be very interested in, in partnering with you on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. And you'll take the next question from uh, Lynn Stiffley from the Water Academy. are you there? Okay, I wasn't sure why I had to unmute. Good morning, um, all, and good morning, Dr. Moletti. Um, I was just wondering, um, is LG uh, CETA looking into blended learning, and how far have they got with that? Thank you. Oh, and there is one other thing. Um, I'm glad you mentioned about counselors, because the Water Academy, a few years ago, um, actually did um, some uh, courses, skills courses for the counselors. And I felt that was very important because they have to uh, do be uh, part of the vote for um, different uh, the spending of money. And uh, it would be very good that they could also understand what is happening on the plants and in the reticulation system and why the money is required. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lynn. We will allow the CEO to respond to this round and then we'll allow another round of questions. Um, thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you very much for, for the questions and those that are not asking questions. We do thank you also. Because it shows that you understand, so there's no... So we thank you for that. I am... Um, I think the... the, the Dr. Prince, the issue of um, traditional leadership, we are developing a strategy. We should be able that uh, the next board is going to be in March. We will have a strategy in place on our understanding because the kind of the questions that I'm asking, we need as LGC that you understand through research to say that what is it that we want to address when it comes to traditional uh, leadership. We're in consultation, with the CEO of the National House. I made a presentation, I think, um, around August there. And there's continuous engagement because they do have a, a National House of Traditional Leaders. They do have Provincial House of Traditional Leaders that are making inputs. What, I've, what I caught when I got to um, LGC was that there were uh, programs that were funded. And my question was, 
what is the science behind this funding? Me, I want to sleep peaceful at night to know that as each and every program, there's a logical sequence of why we are doing that. Then after that strategy is in the board, it will come through to provinces, through our managers, and then you can make input submissions, then it will be adopted into a national uh, strategy. The same that we did with the councillor development uh, strategy. And then OSLIN, we, as, uh, as an organization, we, we do not have blended learning. In fact, in the last management committee meeting, I requested uh, our IT manager to develop a strategy on, on, on blended uh, learning. And he, he indicated that it is not blended learning, but it is uh, integrated uh, information technology strategy and so forth. Uh, we will be meeting uh, probably just before Christmas as management so that he can bring the refined document. Where I'm sitting, maybe just to share my thought process on, on this is that we need to have what we call um, um, virtual classrooms. We need to have a portal where in, let's say for instance, a session like this, there can be a live feed on our website where people can access this kind of information. We want to create a portal where in, for purpose of continuous professional development. Any topic, if you want to talk latest technology in water technology, you just go to our web, to that particular portal and you are able to get information. Information can be through material information, can be through uh, videos information, you know. We just want to have that interactive platform. And most importantly, we know that it is not going to be easy, particularly with our rural municipalities. I have instructed the IT manager to start negotiations with our Vodacoms and MTNs for zero rated fees so that people can be able to access the materials freely. And if it's anything to go by, LGC must subsidize that kind of uh, data that people will, will use. I foresee in the next two financial years that even in our learnerships that we must buy, learning devices, our learners. I want to start with buzzeries, um, 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 and proposals so that we are able to be seen to be ascribing to what we call 4IR, but the world is already moving at 6IR now. And then I think the last part of councillor development was just an acknowledgement and we, we are trying our best to make sure that the, the money of the stakeholders are put to good use and that they can be proper return investment. Thank you, CEO. We'll allow one more round, uh, Reggie. Is there any other questions? I know there is one on the chat. Um, and then, okay. okay, let's first yes. deal with what's on the virtual platform in the chat and then there's one colleague in the chamber that wants to ask. Um, that's the remark from, or actually a question from um, Councillor Grunewald, our former speaker, he says that please indicate the collaboration and synergy with Salga as partner in uh, capacity building. And then I have two hands, um, Ms. Earl Palay, uh, Mr. Earl Palay, sorry. Um, then also our councillor, um, former councillor, councillor Rowan Spies is, is also having his hand up. Okay. So let's proceed with um, Alpha first, um, and then we will go with, um, I'm not sure if it's still councillor, but councillor Smith. And then we will do um, the colleague in the chamber. Those are the three, and that will be the close of the now. <coughs> yeah, that, that we've noticed already. Please proceed. Good morning, all. Can I proceed? I'm Al Palais. Please proceed, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm getting mixed vibes here from the presentation thus far. Is this a business presentation or is it for local uh, LG CETA development, development of our people? 
Um, the previous speaker, Mr. Prince Lou, I think, he spoke about marine, he spoke about um, desalination plants, he spoke, spoke about agriculture. Um, where do all this fit in as we want to empower our people? Upskilling here. Uh, how do we morulate this? Yes, there must be a synergy, as uh, 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 the lady said, and not to operate in silos. But here was a distinct presentation. I couldn't get it if it was business or uh, upskilling our communities, especially the rural communities. Neither there or near, uh, neither here nor there should I say from my experience, we should look at the rural development first. Food security is top of the, of the priorities here. At the, uh, we all know the current economic situation in our country. Our people, they're unemployed. Uh, food is of great, it's the greatest issue at the moment. We cannot change society if they haven't got food in their stomachs. I trust we're all on the same page on that one. So we should try, rather try to develop our people in the agricultural sector before going into the marine sector, going into the, uh, wind, wind, uh, the power generation sector and all that, right? Once we've got that settled, we can branch into the other sectors. I trust we, we, we need to find um, a common ground to understand the needs of our people now, not in the next 10 months or five months. The councillors also need to assist the rural development in the agricultural sector for our people. That, therefore, I'm hammering on the agricultural. If that is settled, then we can move further to the marine, to the uh, desalination plants. These are big things to speak. You need to educate the people about that first. It's not an easy task. Also, the infrastructure is ailing infrastructure. We need to refurbish that infrastructure or build new infrastructure, develop in new in uh, infrastructure. Also, on the funding model, as the uh, uh, Mr. Prince Lou, I think, Professor Prince Lou, as he said, LGCTA funds all these projects, and the TVET colleges are involved in all this. But to my knowledge, TVET colleges doesn't get funding from, uh, from local government CETAs. They, they funded, I'm speaking under correction, sir. I'm speaking under correction. One more time, I'll reiterate that. Don't they get the funding from DHET? That's to my knowledge. Thank you, so Mr. I'll leave you on that one. We can engage on that sometime again. But thank you for affording me the opportunity to express my views. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just to check, are you representing the business chamber? Or are you from business? No. Service provider. Service provider. Okay, thank you very much, sir. We will respond to the questions and we also note the comments. Uh, Mr. Spies, it's your opportunity. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my question is just, uh, I need to know if um, LG CETA uh, will support the development phase of a, uh, of a project, uh, of a project, just uh, uh, developing a collaborative project between, say, the CETA, uh, uh, Skills Mecca, and uh, a B municipality. Uh, without having to access uh, uh, a municipality's funds sell, uh, itself, uh, you know, getting out of the starting blocks with a uh, with a project idea is that type of uh, funding av available from uh, LG CETA? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spies. Um, uh, the colleague in the chamber, sorry, sir, I didn't get your name. The gentleman over here. Yeah, please proceed. Yes, please, because the proceedings are recorded.
All right. Is this one good? Okay. Thank you. Oh, clearly, I will never be a counselor. Don't know how to use this. <laughs> uh, yes, as I was just saying, that I come from an economic development uh, uh, sector. Now I'm taking an interest because I understand all municipalities have a mandate when it comes to economic development. And looking at uh, the current status of economic development at local government level, it is not necessarily a professionalized um, sort of a sort of a sector. Now, I would want to know if are there any plans from local government sector, I mean, CETA, to, to, to professionalize local economic development. The reasons for that is also because of the fact that local economic development is on everyone's lips whenever we talk about municipal uh, service delivery. And now you'll find that uh, some municipalities, for instance, they will just hire someone who has some background when it comes to business management studies, which is not necessarily economic development. And to an extent, you'll find they will also say someone must have a background in terms of uh, development studies, which development studies is quite broad. It is not mainly focused on local economic development. So I'm asking this question to check if the sector does have any plans of professionalizing local economic development. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That is all the questions. I will hand over to you, CEO. Now that I'm the chair, I can delegate all questions to, to respond to. You know, somewhere I wanted to say, I, this one is yours, Chairperson. But uh, no, no, thanks for the very insightful questions. Um, I'll start with the easy one of Salga. Yes, we have a, a collaboration a agreement with Salga, in fact, with the current uh, induction of, 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 of councillors, we have put some money in, I think uh, total for total of 10,000 plus councillors. We have partnered with Salga, Cocta, and AGSA for the 5D um, induction for the new councillors. The second part of that partnership is now to start to look at uh, part qualifications, skills programs, including um, learnerships and uh, bursaries for councillors, because we want to make sure that the, the, the exit opportunities for councillors must not just be limited, that you must die uh, for a position as and when it's happening in the country elsewhere. So, we want to make sure that we at least listen and make sure that the exit opportunities are the broader that you don't have to, we can still participate in other sectors of the economy upon your, the end of your five year term. Um, I think in the next week or two, I will be all over the, the media uh, sharing that councillor development strategy that has been now adopted by COCTA, be a framework for, for uh, and that will use for the next five years and to report against. And then um, to Mr. Pile, um, part of my, of my presentation was to talk on technical matters there, but I decided to talk from that. I'm throwing in ideas that are coming purely from the heart and the experience of me being here. And uh, the four issues or economic drivers that I raised may not be, I'm just saying from, uh, from the drive this morning, I've said agriculture, I've said uh, tourism, I've said uh, chemical, and uh, I don't remember, Food security. For me, I said, look, you, I mean, you've got seasonal rains here. And with that, you are able to make sure that um, <clears throat> you have enough food security. 
to make sure that you sustain the challenges that you may have, whether being from service delivery a point of view or even from a human rights point of view. And I even suggested that you may want to look as a municipality or as a district that you galvanize other local municipalities so that you can now start to look at having a, a district food, a food bank that will make sure that in cases where there's droughts, in cases whereby there's food shortages, we know what happened in case that in way that you, uh, now we know that entry, if, it's, if uh, you close entry for two, three days, it affects bread. We, didn't, we never knew that. These are the realities that you are sitting with and we need to understand the ecosystem and the value chain of our food security. I don't want to dwell. For me, I'm just raising issues. It's up to you how you take them and crystallize them and make them a, 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 a skills intervention. Through, whether through buzzer, whether through leadership, whether through exchange programs, it's up to you. But I'm not going to be that CEO that comes here and tell you what to do, your own uh, economy. Mine is just to support you through the office of Osanika, just to make sure that it, will this work and will this not work. So uh, I'm saying these things and you are correct. I've said it, maybe I didn't say it enough, that when you pursue these things, it must be for the benefit of the local economy, local people. I even made an example with Pazaris to say that, imagine if you can take kids now at grade 10, you give them extra classes in maths, you give them class, extra classes in English, it, you know, maths, science, technology, accounting, instead of coming uh, uh, to schools and saying career guidance. No, we give them extra classes so that we give them the confidence. I mean, I was taught English in, the, in my vernacular, which is the one. The command of English, one had to read literature for you to understand and be able to have the confidence, but not everybody had that resilience. Therefore, as and when we are taught maths in, 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 in vernacular, how are you going to have that confidence to do that? So for me, it was just to say, as LGC, we are responding to that through career guidance, wherein we're going to give extra classes, especially in the rural of the rural, so that learning must not end when the bell or the alarm goes off. Learning can never end in the four corners of the school. And that, yes, you are right, that it is for the communities. And then, look, TVs are funded by the department. But the minister always encourages us to use TVET as our service providers. When you look at TVET recapitalization program, part of the fourth pillar is that we need to work in collaboration with TVET for them to achieve the, uh, for them to be recapitalized. Therefore, we have to work with TVET. And I'm very happy that in Western Cape, we're already working with our TVET. And we need to make sure that we strengthen the relationship with community TVs also to make sure that at the end of the day, we are not just focusing in at, at, at a high level, but we start at the adult uh, education and training level. Look, LGCTA is open. LGCTA now, from next year, because I was still stabilizing the organization, I'm gonna go out and go and look for money. And I said to the MM, I challenged him to say, you go to your council, you ask for your ticket money, and we go. We go from China, Bill Gates Foundation, we've got contact. It's a matter of just starting to, to now do proposals and go and present and defend them. I, was, I mean, I'm on the 6th or 7th of December, I'm going to present at the, at, at the Swiss uh, for the project on food security and, 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 um, and, and finance. We've already done a proposal. We, we are willing. We are not just going to be that organization that wait for money to come through municipal levies because it's not enough. When you cost our APP, our APP needs more than 600 million. If I'm going to be that CEO that fold the arms, then you're not going to get 100% or the impact that we need out there. That's why partnerships are very critical for us to, to meet. So we are open uh, for 
for that. And the last part is the economic development. I, I, I you know, I'm, not, I'm very new in local government. I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert. You know, in TV they say, local government, I'm not dead. Local economic development, I hear, and from what I see, if the municipality don't know what to do with you, they will take you to local economic development. That's a demotion or a nice way to say, leave. But for me, I'm not interested in that. Do we need, do we, do we have to professionalize? Does everything have to be in black and white? Or do you want to start to see the local economic development? We, I, do, I do own qualifications level uh, leadership in local economic development. But personally, if you ask me if there's value in that, I'm going to say no. That's why I said to the discussion of government committee internally, I don't want to see you funding local economic development. I want to start to see local economic. How do you see that? Is to make sure that even after two, three years, there's cooperatives that are still in business, SMMEs that are still in business, that local people buy local. Therefore, that's for me a parameter to say that there's local economic development. But if you want us to professionalize it, I think it can come through your own forums. And But we don't have the time. We are sitting in a time bomb here. And if you are going to want to decorate certain issues that are not going to bring food in the table or in the stomach, then I'm telling you, history is going to judge us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, CEO. And with that, we're going to take a short break, maybe just of 10 minutes. It is now, um, am I right? It's 20 past. No, it's, yeah, it's about 20 past. Can we resume at half past 10? Thank you very much.
Good morning, everybody. We hope that you enjoyed um, the stretch and that you are back. We are uh, indeed back to proceed. Oh. We are indeed back and ready to proceed uh, with the program. Um, can we just have an indication of our colleagues on the virtual platform? Are we all there? Are we back? Anybody on the virtual platform? I see there's 45 participants. Bye, Danke, Bernadette, Exinestra. And I see Lynn's hand is also up. Okay, Jandre Dalport van Esakwa and Senior Esakwa. Okay, then we will proceed. The next part of the program, we'll hand over to uh, Dr. Flores Prinsler, who is the coordinator for the Garden Root Skills Maker, and to our SDF um, at the district, uh, Dr. Um, Reggie Salmons, who will go into conversation around the some breaking news that's happening in the district. Please proceed, gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chairperson. And uh, uh, yes, indeed, I think it will be Dr. Salmons. In, in, in the future somewhere it's part of my part of our plan Reggie and I is to is to help him to to take over and become the doctor for skills maker so uh Jefferson, that's just our introductory slide there uh, just a, a small uh, reminder as as the executive manager of corporate services indicated earlier on as well to the uh, CEO that little steady there, that asterisk against the garden root skills maker indicates that we are um, waiting for the trademark registration. We are going to uh, register that as a brand and then build it as part of a sustainability. You know, once you've built a brand and it's sustained and everybody starts to get to know it, uh, then it really it takes on a life of its own. And we don't want the maker to die in any way whatsoever. So I uh, just wanted to indicate to that. Uh, Jefferson, we've just got a few pictures uh, to show you, and the first picture we want to just show you is this uh, really interesting picture of the website. And this really is breaking news because this will be going live in the next week or so. And uh, I just wanted to ask Reggie, Reggie, can you remember the other day when we were having a chat um, about the uh, skills summits um, that we've had? We've had two of them, and we're thinking about another one. Do you, can you tell us a little bit where are we thinking of going for the next summit and when will it be and, and so on? Can you remember? Okay, uh, thank you, um, Doc, colleagues. Um, yes, we, we, we had two summits. Um, 2018, we had a summit in George. Um, it was the first of, of the skill summits. Then um, in 2029, um, 19, sorry, we had um, a summit in, in Esequa. Esequa was hosting us in Stalbay. So, um, in 2020, just before the, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic struck us, um, we, we intended to have a, a, a summit within um, Naisna municipality, or Naisna municipality were supposed to host us. However, at the last minute, that summit was cancelled. Um, so we are busy planning again, and hopefully this time COVID will stay away. Um, we are planning this year, uh, next year, 2020, uh, March 2020, the first week in March 2020, or the second week. We are planning a skill summit, Kandrut skill summit within the Naisna area. And we were to look at the venues yesterday. So, so it's, it's all guns blazing for, for our, our next summit. Thank you. That's great, Reggie. So the other thing that I think if you just look at this uh, website, there's lots of uh, interesting stuff. But uh, in the um, all forum documentation, like today's uh, discussions we had with Mr. Malete and his slides and so on, that will all be uploaded under the forum uh, and people will be able to download it, the recordings and so on. So we are really moving very hard to a complete open uh, transparent thing. But I think what's also very exciting here inside the uh, district municipality is that uh, we've got a webmaster, an individual who's been allocated uh, almost 100% to really run with our entire marketing, including the website and so on. And he's actually a youngster that works here at the district municipality. And we discovered that he has these incredible skills. He's made movies for CakeNet and I don't know what else. And so we call him BJVR. Who is this BJVR, Reggie? He was here a few minutes ago, but he's run away now. I thought, I think he probably knew I was going to talk about it. But when he comes back, BJVR. Look, um, yes, I think he ran away, Doc. Um, 
this Bernard um, um, Janser von Rensburg, um, this is also one of our success stories in the Garden Road. Um, I mean, um, he's, he's, he's a bit physically challenged in terms of, of, of eyesight and so forth, but he was one of our first persons to, to actually um, graduate um, in, in multi social media uh, um, um, qualification. Um, however, he was still used at the, at the Swiss board. Therefore, um, we upskilled again. Uh, this person was then um, doing um, all sorts of, of training within um, social media and so forth. And then the municipality decided that we can't ignore him any further. Um, we then need to um, make use of his skills. And this is, like I said, the success story is now part of the Garden Road um, um, Skills Mecca team. Okay. Fantastic. So this is really growing your own timber, you know. So we're starting to develop our own people internally. And that's very much part of the whole Skills Mecca thing. Okay, I'm not going to talk much about that. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, over the next two weeks, watch out for social media alerts uh, when the website goes live. I just want to go to the next picture, which all of you have seen in the past. This is this uh, complicated picture that has all these different um, um, various elements on it. Uh, and um, it, it, it effectively describes the whole garden root skills mecca concept. Uh, we are going to have a discussion just now. Uh, okay, hold on a minute. Strix is giving me uh, messages here. She says, I mustn't talk with my mouth full. <laughs> Reggie caught me a little bit there with my uh, sandwiches. So we're still having a conversation, you see. This is so so on. So this is what we're having here. So it's a conversation. But uh, Reggie, you know, if you look at this picture, man, I, I see the, there are three little ladies there. Uh, remember the MM used to say they looked like tricks. Uh, and so on. But who are these little ladies there? Can you remind us what what are those little three little pictures of the girls there? That they, what are they, what is that? Who are they? Yes, look, um, I think we model them in our in, a, in our um, HODs, um, um, um energetic. <laughs> so no, but the, but the idea really is look if we want to make a, um, a success of this garden of skills make a concept and also even the district model if we want to really implement that. We, we obviously need capacity, and, and I think our provincial manager is well aware that in, in some municipalities, we only have one SDF that needs to do internal training, external training. That person also needs to do counselor training. So, so it's, it's, it's a bit um, much for, for one person. So the idea is once we, um, we've established this concept now, Garden Root Skills Maker, it's, it's well established. Um, the second phase now would be that we get um, foods, foot on, foots on the ground. People need to be there at the cold phase of, of, of what, we, what we need to interact with our, with our communities. So the idea is that we then um, employ 17 interns, but now the difference between this, and I, and I think the CEO spoke at length about um, the exit opportunities for, for students and also um, we, all, we have internships all over in municipalities, private sector, but if you look at the exit opportunities or the opportunities um, for those interns, um, then if you if you track them, then you will find that um, they walk from one internship to another. Um, we are glad to announce that the Garden Road, at least our our throughput rate or absorption rate, is about 80% for students <clears throat> that we that we take into our system. The idea with these um, 17 interns will be that we. We've decided that we want to make them technicians. They will be called the Garden Road Skills, um, Garden Road Skills Maker Technicians. Now, the difference between this and, and what our normal internship program is, the normal one is where you have 18 months or 12 months, uh, where people are coming into the organization to do practical work. Uh, what we want to do with these um, 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 interns is that we want to um, take them through a journey of three years. We, we've looked at the model of the ASDA, uh, Association for Skills Development in South Africa, where um, we've looked at the OFO code, um, the uh, 44162, which then um, will give them at least at the end of the, uh, the, the term with us, it will give them an, um, a qualification, it will give them also um, a listing on the professional body, meaning that these uh, learners will be employable and they will be sought after by industry. So that's in short. Thanks very much, Reggie. Yeah. Um, while we are waiting for the possibility of the, the 17 young ladies or guys to be funded as graduates, uh, we have in the meantime decided, look, we better have a plan B in place. 
And so a plan B in place, we in fact have two ladies who are present here today who are starting to do this work. Uh, I have Lisa sitting over there in front of me. She's a CP2 graduate. And we have Trish sitting out there at the computer. In fact, Trish is already running the webinar for us today and so on. So we've already got youngsters who are starting to come into this role. Uh, and that's exactly the idea with the skills maker, build capacity amongst young people to drive uh, skills development. Um, I just wanted to also show you this picture, ladies and gentlemen, which you've seen before, which is our approach with research, working with the employers. But very briefly, Reggie, uh, can you just tell us also, we heard now very recently about this tourism data collection project, a whole lot of new youngsters coming in from national government to help us in the tourism area. What is that all about, Reggie? Okay, Doc, I, I think um, when we started off, we, we've mentioned the two um, skill summers that we had, but I think if we just step a bit further into history, we will realize that 2017, there was a big fire within the Garden Road, um, the Naisna area. So there was a, a lot of businesses that, that went under and due to that, that fire. Um, so that's where we started with our journey in, in terms of the Garden Road Skills Maker, where we, where we um, went to Naisna to see how can we uplift the, um, the society again or the community. So, um, and then 2020, um, the, the COVID pandemic struck also. Um, struck us also so you could realize that the tourism um, industry went uh, went went way under and some businesses closed in the meantime so um, the idea of this this is the project coming from from national um, to national tourism department where they basically want to collect data to see which businesses um, have been affected severely by by COVID and what is the means how can we uh, assist those those um, businesses so um, each municipality received two data capsules from the national department, which then will go um, to these businesses to, to find out what is the, the severity in terms of COVID. So hopefully we'll have this data. Um, those, those colleagues that will be at the local level will then collate the information and forward it to the district um, um, tourism data collectors, which will then in, in, in turn then forward that to national. But this is going to be live data, which can be, we can also use in, in our quest um, in terms of the garden of skills maker processes. Thanks, Reggie. That's quite exciting. And I think uh, we're probably looking at about another 20 or 30 young people now working in the district doing this tourism data collection project, which is going to be excellent. In fact, we today here in the council chamber, we are joined uh, by Bertus Hayward, who's the uh, local economic development manager, uh, amongst other things. I think he does about five jobs uh, there in uh, Riversdale, in Essequa. And uh, uh, he also already They've got a, a few of these youngsters coming towards them, helping them in that area there. So this is all stuff that's happening, colleagues. There's more and more youngsters coming into the picture. My last slide, uh, a chairperson, is just a summary of some of the emerging projects. So this is where we are now really starting to um, hit the ground running, get right down to, to, the, to the ground level uh, and find out what does the district or even the local municipalities, where are some of these projects that will really create uh, work. Um, in fact, I was just wondering if, if we could put Bertus a little bit on the spot, seeing that he's here. Um, you know, we've got this really interesting one developing out there in a place called Melk Fontein, which is about uh, small business development in a very informal sector. And Bertus, in fact, is driving that. Bertus, you want to say one or two words about that uh, particular Melk Fontein project, if you can find a uh, a mic that works, yeah. Tell us a bit from the high plaque, thanks. Thank you, Doc. Um, at the last um, meeting that I attended, I actually gave a short feedback on, on the Malco Fontaine project. And it's also community driven, where um, members of the community start supporting each other, where they start working together and see how they can do a development and uplifting in, in the community. and. And at that stage, I actually used an example of a young boy who's um, building uh, ships with, um, with different uh, materials. So, and he's doing models. And how can we, a guy with that type of skill, how can we develop him and how can we uplift him and how can we maybe create opportunities where he can just not only showcase his models, but also become a further development in, in terms of who he is. So, but also the community is being assisted where they are looking at, at a, a place where they can do um, gardening, where they can do vegetable garden, where they, they are 
sort of also looking for a piece of land where they can do like a, a, a skill center, a little um, tea garden, uh, a, a park where they can do skateboarding, um, where they can ride cycling. Um, so yeah, so 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 they the community is quite active in terms of their partnerships and and stuff. So so yeah, so we are quite exciting. Also, we with our last meeting that we had with the Department of Agriculture, where they also becoming quite involved in terms of that they have a structure there that they used in the past for what they call a mechanization center, where they used to store their um, store their equipment like tractors and 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 plows and and stuff. So. So that facility is standing empty and it seems like that can also be turned around and become like a, a skill center which they can use and, and develop. So, so yeah, so we're quite exciting in terms of what can happen in the future there in terms of collaboration. And I think the, um, the chairperson spoke about it in the beginning, they'll start breaking down silos and, and start working together. So, so I think from that point of view, we, we're quite exciting um, that different departments are working together. Um, yeah. Hi, Dr. Bertus. Thanks a lot. The person in closing, um, one very exciting project which has a, a very interesting connotation. We're looking at a, the expansion of a cannabis academy. We have a, the only uh, the there are only two uh, legal cannabis training academies in South Africa. One is in Gauteng, and the other one is in Plettenberg Bay. And you can just go and have a look at their website. It's amazing. And we've been having discussions with them. And to expand uh, that academy into other areas in the garden, which is relatively easy, they don't need all that much infrastructure. And so, Bertus, maybe even in Melco Fontaine, we can start a cannabis uh, academy and so on. This is a huge industry, by the way. We've been told there are something like 20,000 illegal cannabis growers in South Africa. So you can imagine the RPL <laughs> opportunities there, you see. So, Chairperson, thank you very much. Um, I hope the colleagues that are online and so on uh, are a little bit updated on some of the action that's going around the skills mecca, but uh, we look forward to more and more partners, and we really want to thank uh, particularly the LGC for their support as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flores, on that high note. Um, we <laughs> Thanks for your presentation and thanks for all the information and specifically thanks to our colleagues from ESAFA as well. That's good. Um, we will proceed with the program, um, which is basically the breaking news from the CETA forum. Um, and as the delegated official as well representing CETAs, I'll just do a quick input um, around what's happening in the CETA landscapes, um, what funding has been allocated um, in this particular district, and what is to come. Um, I have shared a, um, yeah, I've shared a spreadsheet which we keep updated in terms of funding and I'll quickly just go through that. Um, so in terms of the transport CETA, um, I have made commitments already. These projects are in place at the moment. They're active for 25 learners to the tune of just over a million. Maybe also just an announcement, the transport seaters funding window, DG funding window for 2022-2023 is currently open um, with a closing date of the 26th of November. So for those, um, Flores, maybe specifically for you as the coordinator from the skills maker, it would maybe be good to have a look at what is there. Um, I'm going to leave my own seater for last, which is the Algae seater. I'm going to proceed with the wholesale and retail seater. I've made a commitment in this district to fund 100 and 36 learners for various learning interventions uh, to the tune of 3.3 million. The MERS CETA is funding 72 learners, um, just under 10 million has been allocated and we can see which municipalities or which municipal areas those learners are allocated in um, or located in. Then the ETDP CETA with a partnership with South Cape College is funding 34 learners to the tune of 1.4 million. And then lastly is Kath Sita, who is funding 116 learners to the tune of 1.7 million. So if we must just do a tally of what is coming into this particular district, we're looking at close to 20 million um, that has been allocated or that has been committed by some of the CETAs in the garden route. And what we should be doing as the skills maker is keeping our eye on the ball, ensuring that these uh, projects are being implemented and if there is allocations coming into the district, that that is being implemented. Because we also know our history sometimes where we get awards from CETAs and then we don't implement for whichever reason. 
Just in terms of the LGC, currently we're funding 198 uh, learners across uh, the, the, um, the district to the tune of 2.1 million. Um, we had a funding window that opened in terms of the changes of the discretionary grant process. We have two funding windows per annum. The one opened in June, July. We've made some awards um, in terms of the discretionary grant advertisement. If you will remember, there was two ads. The one was the DG ad and the other one was the partnership ad. So based on the DG ad, we've made allocations um, earlier this week, last week. Um, and in terms of the partnership ad, unfortunately, based on advice that we received, legal advice, we had to withdraw that ad. And there was a um, an advertisement in the newspaper as described. Um, so we had to withdraw the partnership ad. Um, and there will be a second round. So the second funding window will open hopefully by the end of this month, the first week of December, all right? So it's just going back to the drawing board. So if the district applied under the partnership ad, um, please note that it was withdrawn um, and that there will be the second funding window will open at the end of um, November, beginning December. Another CETA that will be opening the funding window or that is currently open is the services CETA. Um, the, the, um, the funding window is closing on the 3rd of December, so it would also be worth your while to have a look um, at the services CETA and what they would be funding. Um, I thought I would also just use the opportunity maybe just to um, uh, add to the questions that was asked by Mr. Spies around collaborati um, collaborating with the LG CETA on projects. I think one of the areas or how you could collaborate is through submitting proposals when there's funding windows. But that basically means that there needs to be proper planning, there needs to be consultation within the district. And we obviously need to consider whatever we have in our workplace skills plan, as well as what we have in our local economic development strategy um, within the local uh, municipalities, as well as the districts, because that would then be, that could culminate into a nice project for the, for the district. We also say don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, every time I come to this forum, I also sit on the task team and I'm also part of the founding members of this particular forum. I share information around other seaters and what funding windows they would have open so that we can ensure that we don't just look at the LG CETA with limited funding, but we also spread our wings with the services CETA. Um, we have the transport CETA now advertising at the last meeting we had the um, EW CETA, I'm not sure if we put in a proposal there, but EW CETA also had the funding window open. Then just in terms of the question on the local economic development question, I know I spoke to my colleague from Issaquah during tea time, but I think local economic development is the hot potato at the moment. And I think there is no clear guidelines. But maybe some of my comments is that if we're talking, and I agree with my CEO to some extent that we don't have to professionalize everything. But if we say we want to have a qualification, indeed there is qualifications that's registered on the, on the, on the framework. There's, I think, a level four and level five local economic development qualification. In my experience, being at the CETA for 12 years, we have funded those qualifications before. But we find our officials from municipalities drop out. So they don't complete the qualification. So we must also be careful what we wish for, right? So we're asking for qualifications, we develop those qualifications, but people don't follow through. So if we see this, we need to go back to the drawing board and it, and it must be part of our planning in the municipality and it must come through our district plan then to say that, listen, we have a cohort of LED practitioners. They're not quite where they're supposed to be. Let's have a capacity building session for them because that would then strengthen our hand in terms of the district to ensure whatever's contained in our local economic development strategy, which is the second part I want to talk to, is implementable. And it is not a malicious compliance exercise. Yeah, because sometimes we do things in municipalities, which is just to tick the box. Um, so we don't want to tick the box anymore because we want to walk the talk we're saying, and we know that we need economic development within our area. So that is a discussion that must be had in the municipalities and you're welcome to invite the seaters to those discussions. But you know what's happening in your, in your area, in your district, in your municipal area, what is the economic drivers, which small businesses is there. There is lots of funding for small businesses and support. 
I'm thinking we might have, um, I'm not sure if it's still on the platform, but there's somebody that might be on the platform from the um, National Assembly, that is the Work for Small Business. I'm not sure if it's still on the platform. You're welcome and I will share the contact details so that you can come out and speak to your local economic development of, um, officials to tell them what opportunities is there. The one opportunity I know of is the Social Employment Fund that have a, a advertisement out now under the Department of Trade and Industry that is making grants available to small businesses. Whether it is a spaza shop, whether it is a, whatever small business is happening, the Malcoat um, example that you've just cited my colleague from. So these opportunities, but we need to know when we're sitting in municipalities in our local economic development spaces, we need to then craft what are those strategies that we want to implement and we need to look at what is available because all the resources are not going to come from the cities. No, we can assist you with training, we can assist you with capacity building, but then there's other grants. There's our CFIS, there's our CEDAS. Are we tapping into those? In fact, we have a whole fruit department of small business. Are we speaking to those colleagues? Bring them closer because that is that is important in part of our strategy. So even though my, my, my brief is to talk about what is available from CETAS, there's much more that's available and not only from CETAS. And if we're sitting in the local economic development space, then we need to be able to look at all of those um, other avenues. But I will gladly share some of the information that is available. I hope I've answered your question um, in more than what we wanted. But because I know we've been grappling for the last few years around what do we do around local economic development from a provincial level, to a, a, a local level we've been grappling. But these little things that we can do and there's lots of partners that we could go into partnership with to make it happen. So that is my bit um, on the CETA breaking news. Yes, sir, is there a question? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. So uh, two, one question, one comment. Just uh, Martha Collette from CATCETA has just advised us the CATCETA DU window will be advertised at the end of November and will be open until 15th of January. And of course, tourism is, is a big deal for us. So we will certainly look at that. There is a question, uh, Chairperson, from, uh, I think it's Celette Cronier from the Department of Employment and Labor. And she says she would like to find out how they, as a Department of Employment and Labor, can become involved in all these CETA-funded projects in terms of recruitment of candidates or the psychometric testing of uh, possible candidates for these projects. So that those that enter into these learning opportunities are best fit. Uh, this, I think, falls under their uh, SR uh, system. And so on. maybe a comment from your side on that one. Uh, thank you. So let Krenia. Actually, thanks for the question. I think the, uh, there is an important collaboration that can happen between CETAs and the Department of Labor. The, in the Western Cape, there is a very active um, CETA cluster that meet at least one supporter. It's been coordinated by the Department of Economic Development. Um, you're welcome to drop me an email or in the um, chat, you can maybe just leave your email address and I will definitely get into contact with you. Um, and then we can see how we can collaborate. Um, but more importantly, I think it's also important that the Department of Labor is a key partner in this forum. Now, I know, and I think Reggie, when Reggie and um, Flores had the um, conversation, they gave us some context in terms of how the skills method was established a few years ago. And that was, there was devastating fires on this particular strip um, of the province, and as a... Um, and as a response, the, the, the skills maker was established. But we also know working in the local government sector, things evolve all the time. And subsequently, my CEO touched on the district development model and the one plan approach. And similarly, when we look at the one plan, it means all, everybody, um, all public and private entities um, that is operating in a particular space need to collaborate and need to sit around the table. And that's the other message that I maybe want to also to uh, my colleague, Mr. Earl Pillay, that as service providers, we also need to see how do we contribute? Because we also don't want a situation where service providers is part of a process and part of consultation, but only waiting for what is going to happen in terms of business. We also want you to be part of the think tank to see how do we improve the economy of the local, um, of the garden route, and what would be your con contribution as business um, and as service providers to that. 
So I think definitely uh, my colleague from the Department of Labor, there is a space we all need to find our seat at the table. And I think that if we were in the Western Cape, we've done it to some extent, but I think the district development model basically forces us to synergize because we tend to go to our default mode, which is the silos, but now the district development model forces us to synergize and we need everybody to find the seat at the table and to make their voices heard, but also to make the contribution. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Uh, just as a comment, Chair, um, in fact, Solette is actually the uh, nominated representative from the Department of Employment and Labor on our Garden with Skills Maker task team. She was uh, brought on last time. So, yes, we brought them on. Yes. Just, uh, Mr. Alpale, um, just have a comment to say that be mindful many unemployed are not registered at the Department of Employment and Labor. So, that's a comment from Mr. Alpale. We will note that, and as part of the skills maker process, we will embark on a process to see how we get people registered. Um, but that will obviously be a discussion at the task team to put some of those plans in place, but we thank Mr. Pillay for flagging that. Um, we, we're heading towards the end of our program, a very important presentation. We're now sitting on five past 11. I will request my colleagues, uh, Melanie Wilson and Paul Hoffman, you have about 30 minutes um, to present, um, and we will allow the after about 10 to 15 minutes for question, uh, questions. Please proceed. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Melanie Wilson from the Garden Road District Municipality. Um, we, myself and Paul, is just going to do a joint presentation uh, with regards to the proposed alignment for business and service providers um, in terms of the skills maker and the garner of growth and development strategy that is in support of everyone spoke about the district development model and as it is known in the Western Cape, the JDM A1 plan. Um, I'm just gonna jump right to in it. Um, the Garden Root strategic documents that will and partnerships that will guide this process is if you as you are well aware of is the Garden Root Growth and Development Strategy that was approved by our council in 2021. It provides a framework for growth and development planning in the Garden Root for 2020 to 2040. So it's a 20-year plan. It's a long-term risk-based approach. Uh, just to maybe explain when we started with this process, it was prior to COVID-19. And um, in terms, before we could conclude this process, we had to take into account the impact of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, and we changed our approach to a risk-based approach. Um, it's structured according to priorities, uh, which are thematic uh, focus areas uh, through a combination that was put together through a, uh, um, a combination of research based on policy analysis and also lots of stakeholder engagement. Then also we are well aware of the Garden Root Economic recovery plan that has been approved by our council in March 2021. And it was developed as an intervention to address the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic on the uh, economy. Uh, somebody, some people has already spoken about the severe impact that COVID had on all the growth sectors, but in, especially on tourism, which is still struggling a lot, construction, and then also the manufacturing um, sectors. Um, we cannot see the Garden Root Economic Recovery Plan separate from the GDS. It's part of the GDS and it has specific short and medium term uh, um, plans or interventions with timelines that has been indicated. Uh, then in terms, I, I must also mention, there's a lot of strategies that has been approved um, in, uh, at the district level, for example, the Waste Management Plan and when it comes to the different themes, um, uh, for example, the four will also allude to that. Um, you will see that all the strategies that has been approved by council has been embedded in the district in the growth and development strategy. Uh, then also, uh, just to mention, we have the investment prospectus, film policy framework. They were all, all these uh, strategic documents were uh, approved by council in 2021. Um, then also uh, we have the Garden Road Development Partnership, 
Um, this partnership is a collaborative structure of stakeholders, its government and private sector, uh, because it needs to, it, uh, uh, economic development needs to be private sector driven and government supported within the various sectors that will drive the implementation of the GDS and the recovery plan. Um, the garden route, route uh, I think you are all well aware of the Western Cape Economic Development Partnership. Uh, it's um, a special purpose vehicle from DDAC, the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. And the garden route has signed, uh, the DM has signed a three-year partnership agreement with Western Cape EDP to facilitate the implementation of the GDS to ensure that we conduct an inclusive, that it is implemented in an inclusive and collaborative manner. Um, a project manage, manager has been uh, appointed towards the implementation of the GRDP, GDS, and the Economic Recovery Plan, um, who will work closely with the Garden Roots Planning and Economic Development Department. Then also, you can see I'm, I'm demonstrating here, a lot of people have, have spoken about uh, partnerships, and I want to demonstrate that the district has already uh, uh, formed a lot of partnerships because we realize that we cannot do it on our own. It is only through collaboration and doing away with silos that we will, that this document will become a live document and we will only, and we will be able at the end of the day to measure what we have done uh, in this region in terms of, 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 of this um, plan. Then also we have agreement with WESGROW in terms of investment promotion which will include marketing of our investment prospectus, uh, which has uh, a government as well as uh, local government, as well as private sector projects in our prospectus. Then also training. Um, they started with an investment uh, promotion. It's a, it's a training that they presented through WaveTech. Very interesting, very, very, very good uh, uh, training. I myself went through that training and some of my colleagues. Um, so uh, we always, encourage our um, economic development uh, um, colleagues to attend this and also our tourism officials, but it will be expanded also to the business forum members as well as to the business chamber members. So uh, we uh, uh, slowly but surely we will roll it out further in, in collaboration with WESCROW. Then also um, we also uh, have a partnership in place with them for tourism promotion, that is FAM trips and educational. So we want to bring two operators to the region um, to come and experience firsthand uh, what we have to offer so that they can sign business agreements with products and offerings in our region so that we can really ensure that we bring fit not only domestic, currently it's domestic and slowly but surely you see international people coming back, but there is still a hesitancy from people's side to, 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 to travel, but hopefully um, this will change soon enough, but you, when you start moving around, you can already, you hear already some foreign languages spoken in the area, so it's good to have them back, not only domestically, but also the international tourists. Then also we have a collaboration with the Garden Route Film Commission uh, to promote the Garden Route as a destination of choice for filming. Mm -hmm. And um, I must say, yesterday again, we went to a provincial engagement in terms of tourism, we are the only district that I'm aware of that has a film policy framework in place and we need to acknowledge also the film commission in, in that regard for working closely with us and the other partners to make this possible, um, which also um, actually led to the development of a film permitting system uh, that is in place now in the region uh, to streamline and shorten applications so that um, if producers look at the region, they will see it as a film ready and a film friendly region. So that is one of our objectives. Um, and then also we have a, a good relationship with the Department of Agriculture and we do have a formal agreement in place, uh, co collaboration in terms of establishment of emerging or black farmers on, on, on councils, vacant agricultural land. And one of the highlights for, for us is that Council has approved, our council has taken this very seriously and they have proved, approved in, on, on, in October a 20-year lease to a black co-op that is leasing two farms for us, uh, from us in uh, the Dawook area. Uh, the one is Neukredag and Groenefontein, two beautiful farms and they are currently 
uh, busy on that farms. So uh, the, we are trying also to demonstrate that it's only not talk, but there's a lot of things happening um, while we put structures in place. And then also we have agreement with CEDA and DDAT in place, a formal agreement, also to strengthen our collaboration in terms of SMME development and support and also a few other uh, um, initiatives that we want to look at. Then also we have good relations with the business chambers in our region and also the forums, because not everyone belongs to the business chambers, but there's other forums, small, small business forums, et cetera, that we liaise with, that we um, have relationships with. And then also our relationships in, with the B municipalities general is very, very good. So um, I think, yeah, I think that is it. And then I just want to the second slide before I give over to Paul. Um, just from the summit, uh, skill summit resolutions that took place, Reggie alluded to that in February 2019, there's some summit resolutions that's aligned to the GDS. Uh, so that you can see that not everything, all these things are fitting in together. It's not stand alone. And we're really trying to move away from the silos and put things in place so that people can see there are things happening. People want to see what does that document mean to me? What does it mean for me as an SMME? Um, so continue and accelerate collaboration and cooperation amongst all district skills development role players. Ensure that the skills development leverages digital infrastructure as fast as possible to ensure learning and processes as far as possible in skills development to investment and economic development opportunities, ensure that skills development processes in the garden route always proactively considers renewable energy. And if you look at our growth and development strategy, you will see one of our key strategic priority areas um, is uh, renewable energy um, or alternative energy solutions. Then uh, engage with all willing partners, in particular the CETAs and the National Skill Funds to explore development and implementation of projects across the district. And I can ensure, uh, sorry, I can assure uh, uh, the chairperson that from our side, we are applying everywhere to assist SMMEs and also because we know we don't have all that funding internally and not one institution uh, are able to support us so we are applying every way uh, to get funding to the region to be able to assist all our, our stakeholders. Then uh, consider and leverage local skilled people, including retired people within the region to accelerate the growth and the, uh, of the skills maker. And then also public and private skills development projects or programs in all municipalities acknowledge, and that list was already shown here previously. Uh, progressively the support of the development of the new apprenticeship of 21st century and then uh, uh, the, this is also something that was mentioned budget plan implement the skill summit every two years so those are the things that specifically related to the growth and development strategy uh, we also recently had to uh, provide COPTA with an update of where we how we have pro progressed with uh, specifically with the economic recovery plan and when I looked at the progress there, I with the little money that we have, I was quite surprised of what we've achieved actually within that time frame. Um, and then, uh, thank you, Chairperson. I'm just for now going to give over to Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Melanie. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cough, so if I do cough, I apologize up, up front for that. Um, so what has been alluded to, and I think, you know, I, I also attended the meeting yesterday on the JDMA process, um, and there's still a couple of municipalities outstanding uh, with regards to their one plans that they needed to submit to, to the to the national DDM. And, and, and I think that um, puts everything a little bit back, but I think on a, from a Western Cape perspective and definitely from a Gondor perspective that's in place. Uh, and so what we, what we are looking at from a GRDP process, remember that's now the Gondor Development Partnership, is to do a mini IDMA from a bottom-up approach. So, you know, so what, whatever, so the alignment with the, the bigger JDMA will be in place um, probably early in the new year um, to, to ensure that that synergy and that um, processes take place. And, I, and I'll show a little bit later on, on a proposed structure that we, that we are busy getting approved through the processes. So you're getting a bit of a sneak preview, yeah? So if you tell somebody, we'll probably have to come and talk to you a little bit about it, but it's okay because we want to make sure that everybody understands uh, the processes that we want to follow. 
So using the priority areas that's been mentioned earlier, the circular economy, the local energy transition, et cetera, we had a, a look-see at the current forums within the Ghan route that's uh, busy working on a variety of these things, but not necessarily yet focusing on these things as we had it per the GRTS. So um, you can see who we identified as the drivers, and we're actually now proposing that we're going to go into a cluster uh, format um, where we will be talking and I'm going to switch this on here because it's always nice to see a face when we're busy. Um, so, so it's a, a cluster that we're going to form which will and I'll show a bit later will be involved in that process. So we're just bringing that priority area name into the clusters but the drivers will still be the forums and the people involved here. So whether it's a garden route official driving it or whether it's a private sector driving it, that will be determined by the forums and by the clusters once they are fully operational, which we hope will be early in the, in the, new, um, in the new year, um, so that we can actually start implementing it as quickly as possible. So um, when we start talking about other involvement from private sector and other government role players, and, and that brings the, the JDMA a little bit into perspective as well, so that we, we call them gas and there's a double S, um, so don't uh, confuse it with the um, secular economy, perhaps. Um, so we, we're looking at national departments um, and obviously um, other, uh, all other provincial and, um, you know, some other agencies, where grows, the Green Capes, the TNPAs, the CEDARS, um, and international even as well. So we're seeing, a, we're seeing a big picture there in terms of the support from this side. Not a top-down approach all at, uh, at all times, but yeah, so there will be things coming from national, there will be things coming from provincial, but it will be uh, guided into the, the process where the, uh, the the clusters will be looking at it. And we're definitely going to, in the process of forming what we call a, a Gondrut advisory forum, where the private sector will be a lot more involved and a lot more um, focusing on what we want to try and achieve. So we Definitely, as Melanie said earlier, and, and a few people earlier, they, we, we don't want to do this without the private sector at all. It should be actually the other way around. It must be the private sector and, and us assisting and helping. So we're looking at the, the chambers. We're looking at captains of industry. So per town, we're looking at, at identifying those guys that's making a difference in the specific town, sector bodies, and then obviously organized labor uh, as part of that process. Okay, so this is a quite a busy slide, and I tried to make it as easy as possible. And this is the glimpse into the future that we're talking about. So we, we've sort of created, there's a fourth level on top here, which is the, the DCF, the District Council Forum. Um, so where all the mayors normally sit, but we see this group here, which is the current Municipal Managers Forum, to become a bit more of a conduit development partnership, strategic stiakon, where they'll be looking at bringing all the strategies together, handing it down for uh, things happening, and obviously the other way around to get it approved, to look at budgets, to look at the right people getting involved and so forth. So we, we will have a, a selection of people there. So we could see the CFO groups will be sitting there, the IDP will be sitting there, which will later on become the JDMA processes. So it's already in process there. The more technical CECOM where decisions will be made where um, the, the, the growth and development strategy will be broken down and handed down towards implementation clusters here, and I'll speak a bit about that. Um, we're looking at getting involvement from the, all the municipalities, obviously, um, economic development managers, cluster chairpersons, and then the very pertinent place for the skills maker to be, to be involved in that process. Not that they're not going to be involved where the work is being done, but definitely we the feedback will come from all these clusters to go into the process of um, Im implementing the growth and development strategy and the recovery plan. So the idea is that by invitation, we will get uh, private sector involved at this level, but we see private sector a lot more involved in the, in the various clusters. So there, there's actually seven clusters here under the GRDP working implementation clusters, the ones that I mentioned earlier, and they'll be identifying activities and implementation of things and not just planning things. Um, planning will take place there. These guys need to make it work. So um, we're seeing there that, um, in, again, the municipalities, private sector, um, academia, civil society, government agencies, everybody involved here. 
So, we, and as I said, this whole process is a little bit of a JDM bottom-up approach. So this will have to be integrated all the way along. And, and seeing that the meeting was only yesterday, um, I said to Melanie as well, what we'll try and do now is to actually um, put the two together in circulars and where are those alignments, where are we missing to ensure that we, that we look forward to that. So um, I know this is very quick on you, but um, again, once it's formalized and approved by all the powers to be within the system, we'll start distributing that in a bit more um, detail. So very quickly, I'm not going to go into much detail here. So we, we're talking about the water secure future, um, and that's been mentioned quite often by, by our keynote speaker and, and a few other people. So thank you for that. And, and yes, there's not that much innovation in developing the skills yet. And I think that's very much part of, of the, the process going forward. Um, and the same applies to the circular economy. Um, waste is, uh, is an asset, um, and, and we need to see it that way. And, and I think there's a lot of work that's been done. We had a conference fairly recently on, on this whole issue to look at not sending stuff to landfill, but doing something with it, uh, create energy out of it, um, you know, put it into fuel or whatever the case may be. And I think there's, there's a lot of work to be still done around how to put that together. And there's, there's things available in the country, but I think we need to bring it into, into the gone route. And I've seen it's been on the lists uh, from Flores' side and everybody else so far. So that's, that's very good. Um, agriculture, there's a lot more happening in there, but sometimes we feel there might be a bit of a mismatch between current skills and what needs to be availed. And I think that cluster will, when they start picking that up and, and we see Clyde and Willem playing a big role in that, in that process, that we actually get rid of that mismatch and actually make sure that what we do here is what we need here. Um, the tourism, that's one of the ones that there's a lot of interaction in terms of, of skills development. Um, but I mean, I think we need to also be adaptive to current changes. I mean, we had COVID um, and we're always talking about back to normal, which I don't think will ever happen. The new normal is probably also a misnomer and, and, and I'm using the term the next normal. So we need to be adaptive all the way along. So um, the tourism, I think, would be one of those that will have to change on the fly almost in terms of what skills are needed. So very critical that we don't fall into the trap of, of wanting to go back what we had in the past. Um, and then well-being and resilience, I'm very glad to see that cannabis is part of well-being. Um, so <laughs> that academy, so I think that's actually quite a quite a cool um, a link there. Um, and, um, but yeah, so there's also obviously some mismatches there and I think we need to bring that into place. Um, things like construction, things like, um, uh, by the way, yeah, oil and gas and those kind of things would probably fit in quite well into the previous um, uh, cluster where, where it sits with energy. So we're not ignoring any other um, sectors, by the way, by having the priorities. We just needed to, to prioritize and, and some of them will definitely fall under the, the, the cluster. So, so don't be afraid if you don't see your, your sector there. It is, it is involved at some point. So, um, and, then, and then obviously the connected economy, which is transport, rural, urban integration, and ICT. So on the list, uh, that uh, spreadsheet earlier, uh, Flores, when you had ICT as well being, it is a bit a part of that, but, um, but maybe look at that connectivity and, and, and the um, uh, ICT incubator more under this priority rather than perhaps under well-being. It's, it's probably a combination, but maybe that just needs to, to sit in the right priority area. So, so, and then the last one, and then now, I'm almost done there. It's obviously energy, which is very critical to our, our region. Um, and so a little bit of where um, some of the other um, uh, forums can fit in under either the connected economy or under the local energy transition um, cluster. I think that's very critical that we, that we bring that in. And, and there's limited progress, but I think there is progress. Um, and, and I think that's also very critical to, you know, be the leader in that process um, rather than just wait for things to happen. So you can see the um, JDMA process plus together with, with what we're doing in the ground route are very much aligned in terms of these priority areas. Um, and also at the same time, we, we, we would appreciate the situation where we can actually bring in um, expertise from elsewhere to, to guide and, and, and grow this process. So um, yeah, so the, the word is, it's work in progress. I mean, I think it's very critical to understand that um, you know, these, these structures might still change um, based on uh, the progress we take through the, 
um, in all the approval areas, but I think we're on a good track. Um, and also by uh, the, this whole model that we had earlier that I showed in terms of that process is actually quite unique. So again, the, the ground route will possibly be, be very much at the forefront in, in actually implementing Let's, as I said earlier, a bottom-up JDMA rather than just waiting for for what happens from the top, and and we're quite excited that uh, this will this could be a model that can be duplicated elsewhere, in not only the Western Cape but also the rest of the country. So, based on yesterday's discussions, we're already considering having a chat with uh, the likes of of um, Mr. Graham Paulson and, and and that team to to see how we can how we can align these two uh, models with with each other. Um, Medini, over to, uh, to you maybe um, for this last one, and then um, also your closure. Medini, you want to take this last slide and then the closure? Um, thank you, Paul. Sorry, I forgot now to mute. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, as I alluded earlier to earlier, uh, these are the seven focus areas for each cluster. Uh, which will be our working groups. We all these the current activities will be uh, uh, will be captured, and then also speaking about future opportunities within that specific um, focus area. Uh, who will identify and maintain the skills development needs of each cluster? We said, and I think from the skills maker side, it was also a point, uh, uh, the, the driving point that we need, uh, uh, there's a lot of mismatch within um, the sectors in terms of uh, skills demand and skills training. Um, and we said within these different clusters, the private sector uh, should assist in um, identifying the demands for each cluster so that we can, uh, um, we, we can, so that we can ensure, ensure that the needs and the training opportunities that is available is directly aligned with the demands that is out there in the different sectors and that is required in the different sectors. I think basically, um, Paul, that is all I want to say. I don't know if you want to add anything else, but just from our side, thank you very much for the time and for having the patience of listening to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, colleagues. I think you can we can give them a round of applause. Um, thank you, Melanie and Paul, for a very insightful um, um, presentation. We're going to open the floor for about 10 minutes just for some questions. We'll just have one round of questions. So if you have any questions, please use the chat box or raise your hand. I'm not sure if there's anybody in the chamber that have a question. I've noted uh, Councillor de Vries. I've noted Dr. Where is Prince Lou? Um, Reggie, you're monitoring the virtual platform. In terms yes, of um, yeah, there's one, uh, Mr. Palay. Um, I think Mr. Palay can maybe ask this question. Of course, it's quite a lengthy question that they wrote in the, um, in, in the question and answer platform. So I think Mr. Palay can, we can maybe just ask that question. Okay, but yeah. let's start in the chamber, uh, Councillor de Vries, and then Dr. Prinslu, and then we'll ask Mr. Palay, and you can monitor the virtual platforms to see this in the Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. It's possible if um, we can just go to the slide of the structure uh, in terms of the partnership. I just want to see that in correctly. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, the, the one thing that I'm looking at in terms of the final structure, steer code, uh, I'm trying to find where business uh, fits within that uh, structure. And at the, the second structure, I think the one in the middle, uh, it also says, uh, states that it's the uh, municipalities. Um, and then the Garden Road, sorry, uh, the seven municipalities, economic development managers, and then the cluster forum chairpersons. I would like to know whether those cluster chairpersons, whether they are from the business sector. Because one of the, 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 the issues that I have, for instance, with the district development model, is that when you look at the structures uh, that business and the community are, are excluded, 
uh, uh, at those levels. And the argument is being used because, the, but they are part when the IDP at the local level is being discussed. Um, and uh, you know that it's one of my interests that I've become busy with. Uh, so I just want to see how do we accommodate business at strategic level where they can give input, but also be part of the final decision making. Uh, thank you, Councillor DeFries. We'll take all questions before we'll ask uh, Melanie Paul to respond. Um, Dr. Smith. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Uh, and also, I'd like to echo the, the thought of a really fantastic presentation. Uh, this gives us a lot more clarity on how exactly the uh, growth and development strategy will move forward. And uh, my my reflection, uh, Chairperson, is uh, almost opposite to uh, Mr. DeFries. I'm looking at that bottom, the clusters. The clusters to us is very critical uh, because I we are hoping uh, that we get um, approached at the district municipality, particularly the Garden Root Skills Maker. We get approached by employers to ask us to help them to submit proposals to their respective CETAs. Uh, you know, this is something that really we need desperate because that is a demand based model. At the moment, people that approach us are effectively service providers or maybe the municipalities themselves. But we want to turn that around. We want employers, businesses to come to us and help us, say to us, help us with a proposal to, for example, the energy and water CETA. If the local transitional energy cluster want to start putting up solar plants around here, I'd love to have one of these solar companies who's in that cluster come and talk to us and say, help us put a proposal together because we pay levy. They pay levy to the EW CETA but we don't know how to do a proposal. So I, I would like to, I will engage certainly with Mr. Menze and his team, but I believe that the Garden Wood Skills Mecca, certainly the coordinator needs to be more at the cluster level because that's, that's where we are interested in, to actually get projects developed so that we can submit them from employers. There's the Tito one open. I, I really struggle to submit a Tito proposal right now because we have no Tito play, paying in, <laughs> colleagues that talk to us at the moment. Uh, so I need somebody from the transport sector to come and talk to me about a proposal so we can help them. But I can't do that if I don't get that from the clusters. Maybe a comment on that from Paul or Melanie would be fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Prinsloo. Um, I'm not sure if there's any, anybody else on the virtual platform. You've mentioned Mr. Pillay. Uh, Mr. Pillay, you can proceed and ask your question. Oh. Did you see Thank anybody you. else? Thank you, Mr. colleagues. Pillay, can please I proceed. If I can request that you uh, maybe just ask a question or two, um, and so that we can allow our colleagues to respond. Thank you, Mr. Pillay. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. The maritime sector, I, I see there's nobody really um, privy to this, should I say, what's happening in the maritime se sector. Um, that is a multi-billion rand industry. And uh, the previously disadvantaged, I'm not being political or something, please, please forgive me. I'm going to say it like it is. Please forgive me, colleagues. But it's just like it is. Um, previously, uh, overseas coming with a deep sea drilling, all that, uh, certain people benefited only. The previously disadvantaged never, ever benefit in this, not even with the skills, the transfer of skills. I loved what the, gen the, the, the gentleman prior to this just mentioned about skills transfers and things like that. That's a broad sector. However, um, the maritime sector, I don't know who's addressing it uh, in, in, in your organizational uh, um, um, organogram, who's, who's the person addressing this. But this uh, this is huge spin-offs, and there's, it's an ongoing process, this. And there's uh, um, 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 economic spin-offs throughout the year with, with the oil and gas uh, uh, industry. However, um, how, how are you people going to address this? That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Play. I'll hand over to you, Melanie and Paul to respond. Maybe I can start, if it's okay with Melanie, on, on one or two of the questions. Uh, Mel, is it all right? Yes, it's fine, Paul. Okay. Um, so just back to the first question. Thank you, Councillor Zafis. Um, I think the, the idea, and I remember this is work in progress, so at the moment, as we stand, uh, most of the forums are being chaired by, um, by the Garden Root officials, but I think part of the process will be to start looking at the different 
way of, of chairing. So I think if we can get private sector a lot more involved, not all the forums have private sector as involved as they perhaps want to, not necessarily must, but I think a lot of them are, are you know, so remember it was more internal and we're actually pushing it a bit external now with the clusters. So definitely we see the opportunity for private sector to become more involved in managing and running some of these forums. Um, and that, that's that's one of the things we need to suss out and understand and and work on. Um, and I think the if we have the right people on, on that systems, then it will be great. The alternative will be for them to be um, at least running one of the activities or one or more of the activities, if not necessarily the, the cluster, so that we can get the, uh, you know that, that private sector driven approach um, already at that implementation part and in that activity setup. Um, so, you know, activities, there's a list under each of those on, under the, the growth and development strategy already, but obviously they're also already working on some other activities that's in their, in their current forum. So we can, we can start putting them together into, into the one cluster. So we definitely see them more involved in that um, implementation part than necessarily on the technical or the, or the strategic steer com. But we do believe that we are going to look at a process of where we can start looking at finding the right group of private sector people to become part of that, uh, that graph, um, the, the Gondrit Advisory Forum, where there's a high level discussion on, on business and, 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 and uh, government um, rather than on the implementation side itself. So there's a bit of a two-way street. So there will be an influence from the top, but definitely a hard work from, from the bottom side upwards. And I hope I answered um, that question. Um, so, Doc, yeah, I think, you know, ideally, um, you know, if there was capacity and, and um, also uh, potential, you know, the Mecca can be obviously a lot more involved in the clusters um, or Mecca representatives. It doesn't have to be you by yourself or Reggie or, or somebody, but, I mean, obviously... Um, you know, you're welcome to, and we'll talk about that closer to the time when the uh, clusters are being formed. Um, as I said, we're busy with that uh, whole TOR and, and everything else happening at this point, where we can include, um, and that's where we say other forum chairs we need it, can be, for instance, uh, the skills maker, um, we, we're applicable. So that per activity, per implementation, that, you know, those needs are already identified at that point, and that this kind of coordination that you are showing today and, and that we are looking towards uh, implementing in terms of a summary. Um, by the way, I can just um, add that we are working on a template um, a reporting structure as well, um, very similar to what, what Doc has showed earlier or what we've shown on our last slide here, which we will uh, also use as a, as, a, as a standard reporting process. So it's very easy to add in uh, what will be the skills needs and, and what are the requirements and the requests. I haven't shown that now because it's also a work in progress, but we are definitely looking at a way of, of, of um, you know, uh, standardizing our reporting that it's very much easier for the technical steercom and the strategic steercom to actually manage and monitor the processes. Um, yesterday, I understand from the JDMA, they're going to use the, the three color um, schemes and we're going to use very similar, so red light or red, um, highlight for people that hasn't completed and that green that something has been completed that we can keep monitoring at, at various levels. And then the last, <laughs> excuse me, the last question uh, on, on the maritime industry, um, there are already um, smaller working groups on that. So, so from, from uh, Muscle Bay, and I think Gwen, Gwen is on the, on the call here, yeah, that there has been a, a, a call and I'm personally going to be involved in that to look at the maritime cluster as a, as a generic um, so it, it can be broken up into obviously the whole oil and gas thing. And, and yes, where, where there are gaps where um, uh, other groups have not been involved and have not been included in the processes, by all means, I think at, at that level, it can be, can be addressed. Um, and, and I think we're quite aware of that already. And it's not, um, it's not yet been uh, finalized either that specific maritime cluster process, but Definitely, there is an uh, there is a world, world and gas task forum or a task team that's on the go, and a couple of those things. So it is on the radar. It's going to be um, part of uh, or, or as part of the process going forward. Remember, we're just talking about the seven GDS priority areas. But it, again, as I reiterated in the beginning, we're not excluding any other sectors at this point in time. So there will be a, a combination of processes. So I hope we've answered, Melanie. I don't know if you want to. Um, at one or two comments there, just before we close I, off. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Paul. You've actually answered everything. I just want to add maybe that we are not starting from scratch. Uh, we were in the privileged situation that even before COVID-19 hit us, we had working groups in terms of agriculture, tourism, and so forth in the region. So we are not uh, um, we are not reinventing the wheel. We are strengthening and ensuring that the, pro the private sector forms part of this process. And then also where there is gaps that we fill that gaps and also address those needs uh, within the clusters uh, in terms of the growth and development strategy. Um, and then also the whole issue of skills development, I think you have uh, answered it um, properly, but also it's one of the cross-cutting enablers of the then skills development will of course be, um, or the skills maker will be involved in all the clusters. And at the um, regional, the technical steercom, the, the, all the chairpersons of the different clusters will do reporting on everything that is happening in that cluster. And as the chairperson of, of the skills maker forum or the uh, uh, project manager, uh, Doc will be on that technical steercom in any case. So that is all I want to add, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie and Paul. And once again, can we give them a, um, a round of applause? We appreciate your presentation. I think there also needs to be engagement between yourselves as well and the district, the, um, the STF forum in the district. I know there's the skills maker forum, but there's also a STF um, district forum. And I think it would be important to have an engagement at that level, noting that the STFs are now in the process of um, finalizing and consulting around the um, skills plans for the municipality and the district. Ladies and gentlemen, with that being said, I think we've reached the hour where we need to close. Um, I've been requested just to remind everybody of dates for the next meeting or dates for the 2022 calendar. Are you going to show the dates? Or, uh, or I can just read the dates, um, which will then be circulated. Our next meeting will be on the 25th of February, 2022, um, followed by the 20th of May, 2022. Then we'll have the 19th of August, 2022. And then the last meeting for, for that year would be on the 18th of November. There, I'm sure there will be a communique and on the website of the, of the skills maker, all of the dates um, will be there. Um, I've also been requested that our colleagues from the Hesekwa municipality, because I said, why not from the district, but our colleagues from the Hesekwa municipality want to hand over a token of appreciation uh, to our CEO, Mr. Moletti, for making it all the way um, from Gauteng to the garden route. Um, please, sir, if you will receive a, the gift from our colleagues from Hesekwa. You must declare, you must declare. <laughs> I'll tell them in the office they gave you gifts. <laughs> you come bearing gifts. So from Valila ECC. No, we just want to say thank you for being really uh, honored to Thank you. Mr. Pig. Oh, then you better declare double. Thank you, colleagues. While we have the pitch, thank you, colleagues from Hisako Municipality. Um, I think in closing, um, I want to thank the district for allowing me to occupy the chair. Um, and I'm not able to, I'm able to elbow the chairperson, possible chairperson out, but thank you very much for the opportunity and the vote of confidence. Um, I think from our side, um, uh, from the LGC to side, was it, but as the provincial manager from the LGC to say thank you very much to the district and particularly to Trix, Flores and, and Reggie and Angie um, for always stepping to the plate 
for taking initiative and taking the locals with you in terms of skills planning. We know that we're in the midst of also, as I call it, the WSP season, where it's a skills planning season. And I'm hoping that all of the municipalities in the district um, is focusing on that and so that we do it properly when we do it right the first time. I think as a chairperson from this forum, we also want to thank all participants. Um, I think we've managed to keep the audience um, at 40 plus besides ourselves um, here in the chamber. We want to say thank you very much for being part of this meeting. Uh, we want to wish you and your loved ones well for the festive season. We know we're fast heading into uh, Christmas and New Year and all of that. Also noting that I think from the information from our, our scientists and our medical team, we're expecting a, 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 a fourth wave. Um, towards the end of December, um, beginning January. So I want to take this opportunity to encourage all of us, please get vaccinated, um, do the right thing for yourself and your loved ones. Um, please sanitize, social distance. And if you are going to party, because as South Africans, we love to party, we are social beings, please do it responsibly and safely. But from all of us at the Garden Route, um, district municipality from all of us at the skills maker and the LGC that we want to wish you well um, for this year and for the festive season and we're looking forward to seeing you in 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you and cheers. Bye-bye.